So it's my great pleasure today to uh, introduce Coach John Mosley, outstanding basketball coach for East Los Angeles College uh, and uh, the star of the wildly successful uh, Netflix series called uh, Last Chance University Basketball. So Coach Mosley, thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's been been wild. It's, uh, it's like two months now and it's still going. It's still uh, been able to meet with people and talk with on podcasts and different things like that. So it's been still been busy, man. It's still been I, busy. I can absolutely imagine it. Like you were so gracious to come on this segment for us and we looked at your calendar and you're you know it's it's full with with podcasts and and uh it's just it's just I'm so happy that your your story is getting out there we're going to talk a lot about that but if you wouldn't mind um share with our folks the kind of the genesis of how the Netflix series came about yeah so it was a cold call uh interesting man cold call I didn't want to have anything to do with it but I think everybody asked how, why, or how they chose you. And I think the dynamic of what they were looking for, I think they wanted to come to Southern California, a good program. And we actually have in the greater Los Angeles area have probably been the best in the last five years. Uh, and then maybe the dynamic of me being an African-American coach. I mean, there's a lot of variables in there that I think they wanted to include. And I think they captured it all. I initially said, I don't want to have anything to do with it because I, I didn't think I could be as entertaining uh, as some of the other coaches. And I thought the way you needed to be, I said, I can't be that way. Uh, but then, you know, they're it, speaking with different people. They asked me, Hey, you should, or you shouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I was, if I were you, I had a friend of mine, we were at a tournament. He said, you know what? I think people need to see how you lead, how you, uh, you know, live your life out, how, uh, you wear your faith on your sleeve. And I'm like, okay. And I literally walked outside of the gym and I called my pastor right there and asked him. And he, I'm thinking he's going to say, absolutely not. You know, we just want to serve in the church and let's just be humble about what we do. Uh, and, and I, and he said, uh, and I said, you know what, uh, should I do it? And he said, yeah, absolutely. You need, people need to see how you live your life out and how you uh, lead and how you minister to those young men. And I thought, well, how about if I do something to get fired? I may say the wrong thing or they film the wrong thing and I get fired because, uh, you know, here I am. I'm on you know, the world sees me do something inappropriate. He says, well, you know what? You, you don't live that way. And so you'll be fine. And by the way, you know, your life is predestined. God has predestined you. If the door is shut in one there at East LA College, he'll open up another door. And so I said, well, I guess I'll go ahead and do it. And so that's how I kind of came about and, and I agreed, you know, I think they reached out to several and I think there's a, a apprehension from everyone. And I think I was kind of the first to agree as well. So that's kind of how it came about. I actually read an interview, a recent interview with the producer of, uh, of Netflix. And um, so first of all, they did an unbelievable job. I'd encourage everybody. It's called Last Chance University Basketball Series, which is amazing because I've watched all the Last Chance University football series, and I'm a former college football player. And I got to be honest with you, I uh, I wasn't expecting to see what I saw. You know, the theme of the Last Chance University football was kind of hardcore, not belligerent, but like coaches that were, you know, really, really hardcore. And um, your disposition of being a servant leader and which I'd love to, I want to talk more about that, but in the interview. So first of all, everybody that that's listening, uh, you got to watch this. It's incredible coach. I think I told you when we spoke on the phone, uh, my daughter who is in it, um, she called me and said, dad, have you watched last chance university, uh, basketball? And I said, basketball, what, what about football? She said, no, dad, they did basketball this time. And you're really, really going to love this coach. You're really, really going to love this series. And so um, I, I, it, she, was, she was absolutely right. I think I binge watched it in, in just a few days. But I thought they did such a great job of capturing you, the players, the stories. And in the interview that I read, um, the producer said that he figured out in the first five minutes of talking to you that, that you and your program were the right program, which is really, really cool. 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, I was flattered and honored at, at, at the point where I said, okay, yeah, I think I want to do it. Then all of a sudden I was like, okay, let me, if I'm going to do it, let me sell them that, Hey, we'll, we'll try to do a good job. And so I was trying to sell them that day. Hey, we got some great stories here with Joe and Deshaun and uh, really it's 15 stories. They could yes. them all, but all these young men had some of the same issues and is a, a battle of leadership and so many different variables that and dynamics that go into it. You can't see it all, but, and, and then they kind of came, you know, almost mid season and started. So we talking about battles all the way from, a couple months even prior to the when even they started filming there's a lot in there it's really really cool and it's a great place for us to dive in as as i asked you would you come on the podcast and and talk to us about the parallels of what you're doing and and uh you know to the business community but one of the first things that i wanted to ask you about was like in your coaching style mm -hmm. like what's really what i really what endeared me to the, the story was how you have this leadership style that has the ability to meet these kids wherever they are. And I just wanted you to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, you have 15 kids, they probably showed about three stories, but there's 15 kids. And mm -hmm. my dad used to say to me, hey, John, everybody's got a story. And mm -hmm. I know there's 15 stories there at least. So mm -hmm. how do you as a leader, how do you you know, differentiate the way that you lead and figure out a way to meet these kids wherever they are. I was very impressed with that. How do you do that? Yeah, you know what, John, I'm 47. Yeah. And our ages, you know, I'm, I'm the most, I'm all mature now. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not 19, 20. I'm, I'm mature. And guess what? Next year, I'm gonna be even more mature. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm gonna have growth. And when I'm 50, I'm gonna be more seasoned. And sometimes we forget that that every year, or and, and as you related to business, if you're bringing in a new, uh, you know, a new partner or someone to work with, every year there's someone new, or or if there's an intern or someone, they're new, they're 17 years old, they're 18, 19 when I bring them in. And so as I grow older, it's still the same 18 year old. You know what I'm saying? Because I'll get to 48 years old and, and I'm not bringing in a 47 year old, you know, one year behind me who's mature. And all I have to do is teach him. We're dealing with the same. And I remember when I was in my twenties coaching, oh man, I was so fired up. I understood, I got it. And I just see me, you have to see yourself and remember where you were at when you came in. You have to remember where you were at when you had this certain issue. I have to remember where I was at when the officials made bad calls and uh, I was in that same headspace. Of course, I'm 47. I'm telling the kids, hey, don't act like that to an official. But hey, it, I mean, I remember being in that same space. And I think sometimes we forget and we mature so well and we do so well and we get all these acknowledgements and we get all these accomplishments and we forget that we were that same 17 year old kid or that same uh, entry level position. We forget what that entry level feels like, mm. where everything was new to you. You forget about that. We forget the anxiety that we had as that in that entry level position. How do we forget that? We forget that leader, or we have three different leaders that are leading us. Three different su supervisors in, in in these categories. One leads different, and we kind of clung to this one supervisor. Why? Because they had a little more compassion. And we wonder why we don't get a response from this one or that one. Well, how can you get them to get you to follow through or why do they call you? Because you're more approachable. And so we forget that, you know, when, 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 as we mature. And, you know, faculty ask me, well, Mosley, you're doing a great job with those guys with basketball. How come all the students want your class? How come they all sign up for your class? And I said, I remember when I was 17, I remember, uh, when I made excuses for not turning in papers and all that, I remember that sometimes they sincerely wanted to get done, but they 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 truly maybe procrastinated. So I, I'll let them. I'll, I'll have a bypass on the procrastination. And I'll say, you know what? Let's just get it done. And they say, man, he really understands. He let me. I'm not gonna let him down now because he understands me, or because he gave me grace. I'm not gonna let him down now. And I think if we we sometimes we forget that and we get so hardcore 
because we got it all figured out. And we get so hardcore, but I see me, I see, I see myself when I was 17 and when I pouted and I complained and I just got to remember that. And I got to kind of pause and say, okay, let me think of the headspace that they're at. Mm. I think that's such great advice. It's like, so the first part of that is uh, recognizing, acknowledging and relating to the situation because we were those people once in our career so great leaders i think do a great job of that but the older we get the the more energy it takes mm -hmm. to actually meet somebody where they're at and at the same time not damage the culture of the team so you know talk a little bit about how like it takes energy like joe's a great example and i think joe's story is awesome and and uh, Deshaun's stories are great, but you're meeting those kids where they're at and kind of not putting the team on hold mm -hmm. because what I realized was the whole team is watching how mm -hmm. you're dealing with those individuals. So at mm -hmm. first I'm like, where the heck does this guy get this energy to be able to deal with these hotspots as hotspots and not just try to deal with it from a team culture perspective. And then I realized when you're going one-on-one -on -one with these individuals, the team's still watching. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it, the older we get, the energy that it takes to meet people where they at. And I'm thinking about also when a parent tells a child, not that you're a parent to these, to these folks, uh, but in many cases, they, I could tell they're like looking at you as a parent, which was just awesome. Sometimes the child looks at the parent, it's like, because the parent is trying to coach or develop or mentor well back in my day when I did what I was doing and right. it turns the kid off like yeah. that's not what you're talking about you're they know that you know the situation they're in and yeah. I didn't see you once say hey let me tell you about it when it was in my day you were totally invested in their story so do you have any yeah. further comments on that like that takes energy dude yeah it's it, it takes a lot because it, I see it all the time I, and I try to sit back because I, I say, hey, I don't want to be that guy that's not cool anymore. You know, I'm, not, right. I'm, the, I'm the dad with the wearing the uh, dress shoes with the socks all the way up. I don't want to be that guy. So I try <laughs> to stay relevant. I, I, I won't compromise my integrity to be that, but uh, I want to make sure that I stay relevant. And I think it's important to stay relevant to to where their headspace is and what they're thinking. Uh, it doesn't have to change how you feel or, or what you believe, but know where they're at so that I can, you know, even be more, just relate to them a little bit more. I mean, I still listen to a little bit of the music. And like I said, I'll listen to the music, but, at the, but then you're going to listen. If I listen to yours, you're going to listen to mine. But that gives me a chance to see where their headspace is and, and to see what that culture is like. This new culture, that uh, this new team culture, uh, kind of that I have to kind of transition into believing what we're trying to do. Okay, what what does this new era think about what we're what we're supposed to do or what we're trying to do? Uh, I have to let them meet them kind of halfway and say, you know what, I get it. Kind of like in basketball, I get it. Those guys want to dribble more. They want to be more Kyrie Irving or James Harden or Steph Curry make all the threes. So how can I kind of bring that and kind of meet it? Uh, at the same time and, and, and bring some of my culture, but allow them to, the freedom to do some of their culture as well. Uh, we got to be real cognizant of that and real, really kind of, uh, you, you have to allow it. You got to give them the freedom. Um, but you, you also have your discipline, but then say, okay, you drop in and you allow them to have that freedom within these four, you know, this box or this parameter. Yeah. Hey, I got this box at a parameter. Okay, you want to shoot the three pointers like Steph Curry? Perfect. You can do that as long as you do it in here. And you know what's interesting is if, if you kind of sell them on like, yeah, you can do that. Go ahead and do it. But it's within these walls. And then it actually meets halfway because within those walls, they can't actually put that many threes up that Steph Curry gets off. But you could still, uh, you, you shaped them and, and you've given them the, the dream to go ahead and do what you want, but it's within these walls. And it actually kind of meets halfway. I love that. In this, in this spirit of culture, um you're in in the way that you build the culture we have this principle that we call the skill will model in our business and we share it with businesses and basically it's a great assessment to find out where an individual is at any given point of time 
And it's a relationship between skill and will. And one of the most difficult uh, uh, people to manage in business is somebody with high skill and low will. And will is defined as motivation, behavior, attitude. And again, um, I think for our listeners that hear us talk a lot about the skill will model, we're very, very specific on you've got to confront the, you've got to confront the behavior. You have to, um, you have to make sure that that behavior is, it knows that, you know, you got to do it with dignity and respect. You have to let the person know that that behavior has to stop. And for our listeners, I just, as they go through and watch you do what you do, I want them to think about the level twos. We call them level twos. These are high skill, very high skill, but low will, low motivation, low behavior. And what you introduced for me, for my thinking from a business perspective is, by the way, if you look at the graph, the only place that that person can come from is a high skill, high will, meaning they had to have been what we call a level four, and then something happened. Yeah. Like, so for our listeners, when they watch your show, when they watch that show, your ability to invest in people's stories, like we can talk about it and say, you've got to be able to find out the story. And man, you are a classic example of managing level twos and getting them back to level fours because most of the time level twos, they just got wrong somewhere. And it's not even very rarely has anything to do with the leader. It's something in the past. And the leader, most leaders look at that and go, hey, I didn't even do anything anyway. So like, what am I supposed to do about it? But your capacity to get into their story and help them connect to their story uh, for the betterment of themselves and for the betterment of the team, I think was just outstanding. I mean, it was, it was yeah. killer, dude. Really I think, good. I think you have to, uh, in order to get, anybody to respond i think you have to care about them first yeah uh, they're not going to respond because there's damage there's abandonment there's so many things that prevents them they really want what you want they want to attain that so you, you say hey we want them to meet these numbers we want them to i mean who's not going to come and want to make more money or build numbers or grow or in, who doesn't want that they all but there's a block there's a, there's a block and there's a there's a wall blocking them from pursuing or moving because they're they're damaged from some abandonment they're damaged from some level of disappointment or leadership disappointment or something in the past and for me it stems from these young men what if, what abuse did they go through when they were younger uh, we talk about Joe Hampton and if you watch the show you'll see he goes from this great star in high school and then he goes to the one of the top high schools in the country and then he signs at a high major program and then all of a sudden it all falls apart right and then he builds his way back and now he's with me and they're saying why is this kid acting like that well if you go back and look at his story and you see and you understand the story and for me when people told me about him they said you don't want to mess with that kid he's you don't want to deal with him he's got all his talent He's phenomenal. He's a four star and we categorize him as one, two, three, four, five star, five star, meaning you're going to be like LeBron James. So he's like a four star, which means he has the shot to make it. He's a four and a half star. But what happens when you look at it, everybody sees him as his four and a half star in high school. He blows out one knee. He blows out a second knee. He's at Penn State. He doesn't know how to respond to that. Why? Nobody ever taught him how to respond. Why? Because all he did was celebrate him. They didn't teach him how to go through adversity. So now you look at in the past, he never learned how to get through adversity. He never learned how to fight. And so now this great person with all this skill, with all this talent, first time meeting failure, first time meeting disappointment, first time meeting abandonment, and he doesn't know how to respond. He was never taught how to respond. Why? Because when he was younger, he was never taught. He never had a father figure at home. He never had all these things in place. He never had the proper foundation and so now he doesn't have the motivation to, to make a comeback. He doesn't have all these things. And so I can see that. And I saw he has the diamond. I, we saw, like, as you talk about those skills, you see the diamonds inside, but we got to just peel those layers back to find out why we can't get that diamond out of there, why we can't chip away and figure out uh, what's there. And it's not everybody's calling. 
You know, there's some guys that be like, you know what, I'm not dealing with that. I don't have time to deal with that. And that's fine. If that's not your calling, if that's not who you are. But if you say you really want to help and really want to pull the diamond out of that, whatever level you're talking about, you know, I'm talking about the four and a half star. I really don't have to deal with Joe Hampton, but I wanted to deal with him. I wanted to deal with him for him. You know, we sometimes just want our performance to work and say, okay, I, it's just all about me and what, what I need. If he's not going to work out for fine. Well, that's for me. I, I just have the compassion and the, and the, and the, and, the, and, and that's just, that's just me because I want to see him successful. And then when, when I care about him and he sees that I care about him and I care about his success, not just about our team's success, but I care about his success as a person, then he's locked into our mission because he sees I'm, I care about him. I care about, he saw that before he even set foot and got one rebound for me or helped me in any way, I helped him. I helped him get out of jail. Okay. So before he helped me, I helped him. And then there is, he saw that I cared about him. So now for me, it was easier for me to sell him and say, look, man, I care about you in order for you to have success, which he wants to have success. Anybody else comes to him, they say, we want you to have success, do this. And he pouts and says, no, I'm not doing that. Right? I tell him, I want you to have success, do this. He knows that I care. And he knows he's afraid of abandonment again. He's afraid that he'll be disappointed again. So he puts on a front and say, no, I'm not going to do it. But with me, he trusts me and I've built equity in him. And he knows that, all right, coach, I'm going to do it because I trust you because you've already invested in me and you did not give me, I did not give you anything and you've already invested in me. So I think that's what I, I, I try to do is I try to build the equity up before and a young man will come to our campus right away. And they say, coach Mosley, I want to come to school there. Guess what? They have no reason to trust me other than what we've done in the past. So what I do is I show them that they can trust me by let's sign you up. Let's get you in those classes. Let's get you started properly. Let's make sure you get all of the needs that everything that you need so that you're the most comfortable. And now guess what? I've built up equity in that relationship. And so now that that equity is built up, then now when I ask them for a proper response, I'm going to look and say, you're not going to respond or is your character that low that you can't, I don't deserve a response after I've, I've kind of put in place the trust where you can see, I really care about you. And it's hard for anybody in the world, the worst person in the world, after you've invested in them without getting anything from them, it's hard for them to not perform for you. And I found that to be successful almost 99.9% .9 guaranteed. If you invest in that person first, they're going to give. And then once they give, then say, okay, now I'm going to pour more into you. I'm going to invest more into you. And then guess what? They're going to give back. But what happens is we're going to say, hey, look at what we have. You need to come here and get what we have. Do what we say do. Most people aren't built that way. There are a lot of high achievers that are built that way. And that's the people we want to work with, right? We want to sit back and wait for everybody to come to us, say, look at this great organization. Look at what we have. Come be a part of this. Come sit here and do. There's not many people willing to say, let me go down to the gutter in the trenches and get some of those diamonds and let's wipe them off and let's build them up. And I'll tell you this, I'll find this to be true, that a lot of those diamonds that are in the gutter are worth more than a lot of those, the diamonds that are already, that are, that are pursuing and coming to us. Because they've kind of already figured it out. And those are the little smaller diamonds. That's what I feel. It's the ones that are in the gutter that usually the ones. I tell you this, the, the ones that help me win the most are the ones that are in South Central or in the gutter, in yeah. lots. Because they, they have a sense of, they have a, 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 a sense of toughness. They have a sense of, of, of how do you put it? Uh, you know, the, what do you say about the wine? They, they get a chance to, to kind of mature. Well, it's and, like the diamond, it's the diamond example you're giving. The most valuable diamonds are the ones that spend the most time under pressure. Under pressure. Yes. And so they, they've been under pressure so much. And if I could just peel away the response and the, the pouting or the lack of motivation, if I can peel that away, those dudes, they win for me. They win yeah. 
once yeah. they know that they can trust you, those are the ones that like, coach, we ain't losing no games, coach. Guaranteed. That's on my life, coach. We're not losing. Once they know they can trust you, but before that, they're going to pout, complain. They're going to look at you side-eyed, and they're not going to trust you. It's Why? So, because uh, they had nobody that they could ever trust. But once they trust you, they'll they'll give their life for you almost. Got so many nuggets in here, coach. I, I want to just paraphrase or just recap some of the big things that you're saying here. Um, you give, you get. And so from a servant leadership perspective, you're coming to that situation saying, I know I got to give so I can earn the get. And then once I get the get that I've earned, <clears throat> it's mine for life with these guys. It's, yeah. it's mine for life. And I think what happens to leaders so many times in, in our world, in the business community is they feel like they've reached a certain place. Okay, now I'm the leader. You come to me. I'm yeah. building a program. And if you want to be a part of my program, then okay, that's great. If you have the, if you have a rocket ship software company or what have you and you, but if you're trying to recruit those people that you had, they have tons of potential to get them from like, you know, level two to a level four or what have you, it takes effort. And the strategy has to be, you've talked about it already, meeting them wherever they are. Uh, you give, you get and authentic servant leadership. So, and that, by the way, if you're listening to this, when you watch this series, make some notes for yourself on, you know, how can you reach people wherever they're at in your team? When you're looking at your team, how can you reach people wherever they're at? Have you earned your team's trust based on what? And do you know the story? So when you're upset with somebody, when somebody's driving you nuts, if somebody slid from a level four to a level two, there's always a story there. Do you have the skill set as a leader? to go invest in and the energy to go invest in that story. So that, that was an awesome recap, brother. That was so good for our, for our people. Let's talk a little bit more about the culture. If you don't mind this, this concept that comes up is nobody fails. Like I know people are going to like you, you say to them while they're running sprints and everything, it's like, nobody fails. Nobody fails on my watch. And when I first watched that, I'm like, man, Coach Mo has taken all that accountability and all that responsibility onto himself. But yet that's not what you did at all. Yeah. You changed that into the only way you can fail is if you walk out a door on yourself. And could you talk a little bit about that? Like where you kind of where you kind of came to that, like nobody, I think you call it like nobody fails. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Nobody is going to fail on my watch because I'm going to do everything possible and failure. You know, I'm not talking about you fail from making it to the NBA. I'm talking about failing to, to change the response so that you can be successful. You're going to have all the tools to go out in the world and be successful under my watch, unless you walk out the door. So when the guys come in, they want a college scholarship. So they come into a two year program so they can get a four year scholarship. They can move on and go play ball at a university. I'm gonna give you the tools. I don't, that doesn't mean you're gonna be at UCLA, North Carolina, Duke, you're gonna get one of these grand schools, but you're gonna have the tools that wherever you leave and you go to, you're going to be able to have success in that, in that space. Unless you walk out the door, you won't get all of that. Now, it, it's going to be painful and it's going to hurt because I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to put you under that, that pressure and under that fire. Uh, and I'm going and to hold you accountable. But you're not going to leave here not prepared to have success. So I think as leaders, what I put on myself, the responsibility I put on myself is the is I'm going to have these guys the most prepared as I possibly can. And that's what I mean by the fair. It doesn't mean, well, Coach Mosley didn't get him a college scholarship. Well, maybe they, they, weren't, maybe they weren't good enough for a college scholarship. What I'm talking about is, are they prepared to, to take on that, that next phase in life? And, and that's properly responding to all the adversity that they're going through, properly handling uh, showing up on time, all the details, all the, the, the structure that we have in place, do you adhere to that so that you can perform at the next space? Heck, you may leave 
East LA College and, and decide I want an entry level sales position. I want to do this or that. Well, you're going to be prepared because you're going to know how to wake up. You're going to know how to deal with adversity. You're going to, have to learn how to time manage. You're going to learn how to take criticism. You're going to learn how to take criticism when you don't deserve it. Take criticism when you do deserve it. And you're going to learn how to take it. And so I try to put them under all that pressure. And I know sometimes I criticize and they don't deserve it, but I want to see if they can handle that, that criticism. And it's not, it's not criticism, uh, it's not abuse, but it may be criticism that they don't deserve, that somebody else deserves. But I want to see if we can handle that because that's what happens in life. And we're talking about life skill. We're talking about business and career skills. All these different things are going to happen. And I try to take them through adverse situations that you're not going to fail. And it's my responsibility to make sure that you're prepared not to fail when you leave here. That's, that's the responsibility I take on. And some of us don't want, they, they kind of put, well, that's on him. You know, well, and I think if we want to have the most successful businesses, programs, anything, we, we got to take that responsibility on as leaders. It's like, I take that pressure. I take that responsibility. Like if one fails, we all fail. And that's, that's my responsibility as a leader. And then when I see them fail, I take that burden home with me. Uh, when we lost in the, in, it, w not lost, but when we, when, when COVID hit and everybody asked me the same question, what were you feeling like in the locker room? And what I felt like in the locker room is I let everybody down. Because I said, if, I, if you do everything you're supposed to do, you're all going to have success. We're going to get, and I felt like I let them down, even though COVID was the situation. And I know I'm telling this, giving the story away for, you know, I'm spoiling it for those who you haven't done it. it yet. You haven't done it yet. Yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, uh, you know, I felt like I, I, I let them down and I, I always have to take that burden on me so that I'm doing the most that I can do. And it's almost like I've been fortunate that the only way that it doesn't happen is if somebody walks out the door, you walk out there because yeah. I am going to come with the highest level of energy every day. I'm going to care about you every day. And you know what, as leaders, they'll say, well, wow, he's great. You know what, I don't wake up that way every morning, but I have to find a way to find that energy to not let my team down. I have to have a great day every day. I have to bring the enthusiasm. I have to bring the energy. I have to be the one to set the tone every single day. And so when they see that example, that I'm not gonna let them down, I'm not gonna give up, I'm coming with energy every single day, then they have no choice but to come with that energy. Okay, you're not coming with that energy. You're letting yourself down. I'm not gonna let you down. You're not gonna fail on my watch. You're not gonna not go hard because Coach Mosley's not going hard. Yeah. The reason why you're not going hard is because of something that you, now we can address you, but you're not gonna have the excuse that, well, we didn't become stronger. We weren't in good shape. We didn't have the right plays. It's not going to be because of me. I'm going to make sure that I do everything that I can do. And it's I'll brilliant. You, it's brilliant because the accountability lands right back where you want it to be, right on the player themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But you're bringing your best self every yes. day. So the excuse department's closed about what you're doing or what you're not doing. And therefore, yeah. the accountability, it's like, a, it's like bounces right back to them. That's brilliant. Yeah. And I take the accountability. Well, I didn't play this player. I didn't run this play or that play. You can blame me if we lose a game because of that, but uh, it's not, you're not going to blame me for not being prepared physically, mentally, effort, and responsively. You're going to be able to respond to all the situations, and so you, you, you won't be able to, to blame me for that. And You're going to be prepared when you walk through the door of any university or college in your next step. Let's talk a little bit about fundamentals, like in sports and business. The dilemma of the leader is how do I get how do I get the fundamentals in place? How do I get sorry? How do I get the individual focused on what it takes from a fundamentals perspective to win championships? I mean, they talk about Coach Wooden, you know, starting with tying your shoes and the way you put your socks on so you don't get blisters. And he 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 ties that to winning championships. When you go to work every day and you're picking fundamentals. How do you keep the team focused on the reason why we're doing these line drills or the reason why we're shooting a hundred free throws or whatever is because we can see ourselves in the championship. How do you bring the short-term and the long-term vision and goals together with the tactics of the day? 
Yeah. So I think you have to have a storybook. So I've built up a storybook. So I've built up the stories that can sell them on in terms of examples. And I think it's no different than when you walk through the door and you do sales or you with a management team, you have to have a storybook and you got to put that storybook so they can see the examples of the failures and successes of not following through. Because if I just tell them to do it a lot of times, then, you know, I could tell my kids to do something and they're like, yeah, sure. But if I give them a story of, of what could or could not happen because of that, not to threaten you, but here's the dream of what happened. I tell a story about a young man. We have this, this fundamental call free throw line rebound, right? So when you shoot the ball, you drift to the free throw line. Most guys like to shoot the ball and they pose and they look at themselves. They watch the ball go in. Well, we have a simple technique. When you shoot it, you land and you drift to an area where the ball, if you miss it, we want to assume that you miss it, will go, right? So nobody really wanted to, there's not a lot of people that want to buy into that, right? Like, coach, I'm going to make this <laughs> shot. I don't, what are you talking about? What does that have to do with basketball? What does that have to do with dunking or anything? Well, I'll tell you, I had a young man done it phenomenally. Nobody recruited him in high school. So I'm, I'm telling these stories like this. Nobody recruited him. He's one of the best shooters, right, in, in our league and in the country. He could do nothing else but really shoot. He shot over 45%, which is a phenomenal percentage. 45% makes at the three-point range. Nobody recruited him in high school. He comes to us. This one small skill set that he learned, it allowed him that when he missed his shot, he got his, his, his own misses more often than other people got the ball. So if he missed it, he got his own rebound more often. He learned that so well. How about this? Now his percentages of success on the court goes up. He shoots it. He makes it 45% of the time. So what happens the other 55%? Guess what? Now he adds 25% because there's 25 more percent of when he misses it, he gets his own rebound. Yeah. Now there's more production from him. This young man, as you saw a clip, and this is why I mentioned him on the show, his name is Frank Burtz. Nobody recruited him out of high school. He comes with us, and he was an all-conference player. He's a good player. He's athletic. He's about 6'5". Johnny Dawkins, he played for Duke, right? Johnny Dawkins is at Central, uh, Central Florida. Johnny Dawkins and his staff said, you know what, we're just looking for a shooter. Best shooter left. Scouting service says, Frank Burtz is the best shooter left in the country for junior college. So they say, let's go take a look. Here he's at East LA College, nobody's recruiting him. Best shooter in the country left. The reason why Johnny Dawkins said, oh my gosh, I want that kid. He ends up playing for Central Florida. He's playing against Duke when they had Taco Fall and they went yeah. to the NCAA tournament against Duke and they lost by, a, a, I think Johnny Dawkins' son missed the tip in to beat Duke. They almost beat him in the Sweet 16. Frank Burtz is playing and he's on that team and Johnny Dawkins won him. The reason why, he says, not because he was making all those threes and he was one of the best shooters left in the country, but because he had never seen a player track down his own rebound uh, and, and now it adds more value and, and, and more production. So not only is he a good shooter, of course we taught him all the other stuff. He can defend, he can pass. Everybody has those things. But he added value to himself by getting uh, these details. He added value that, all, er, yeah, everybody was a shooter. Everybody can play defense, everybody. But he added value to himself by being able to track down rebounds because he – Locked into that one little detail that I've been trying to get everybody to lock into. So I sell that story. And now guess what? I sell that story to everybody and they go watch films of Frank Burtz. And now guess what? All of the shooting guards in my program that come here on out, guess what? Now they all track down. They go free throw awesome. line rebound. So I couldn't, once you get somebody to do it and you can sell them on, look at what this went from zero to hero. I got a guy that yeah. went from zero to hero because he locked into that one detail. So you have to have those stories so you can share because it's hard to get uh, individuals to dream and believe and say, 
and share those stories. Let's say, look, sharing the story of, yeah, we share story of CEOs and dreamers and, you know, the guys at Microsoft, the guys here and the guys there, the guy at Google and all that. Sometimes those dreams get too far, but if we could just tell some of those, those short-term stories of success, if we can have some of those, you got to have that storybook together. And I found that to be successful to sell them on the, the little small dreams. Like, look, if you just jump stop, we lost the, and we did, we lost a, a, a state championship game because of a jump stop because he didn't jump stop, pivot, turn and pass. And I was able to sell it. We lost it. They called a turnover. The team scored the bucket and we lost the game. And it, of course it wasn't because of that one play, but right. you got to be able to tell those stories. But Frank Burtz, he got that scholarship and he's continued to play. Everybody said he's not going to play at central Florida. He played because he still did the same thing. He shot every, yeah, he shot the ball 45%. But Johnny Dawkins knew that he was going to be even more productive because he was going to track down offensive rebounds that nobody else could do because he learned that skill that nobody else thought was important. I love that. In our business, in our world, we call that a proof point or a testimonial. Yeah. And for me, what you're doing as the leader is that you are connecting, you're giving me the purpose in the future. So you're mm -hmm. telling me the purpose of this drill but you're not stopping there. You're mm -hmm. telling me the purpose of this skill set will connect you to your future, whatever that future is. And the minute what we find is the minute someone can see themselves in the future and connect it to what you're asking them to do, they'll never forget it. They'll yeah. never forget it. And you're telling the story with passion and emotion. And some leaders yeah. are just like, you just need to do it and trust yeah. me because I told you to, that that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And like the way you tell that story. So just a note to our listeners, man, your, your stories, you have to invest in your stories. You got to get people emotionally connected to the, to the tactics that you're asking them to do and connect it to the purpose of the future. And well, I, I love back, that. Yeah. That yeah. goes back to caring about them. Yeah. Like they cut out some of the parts, but I was telling Joe, I'm like, Joe, I see you back in the big 12 or the big 10 conference. Come on, Joe, I see you there. And he couldn't see himself there. And I said, I see you there. I said, let me tell you about this person, that person. Hey, let me tell you. And, and we did. I did get a call from University of Kansas on Joe Hampton. He's like, for real, coach? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I showed him the phone call. So we got to, but, but that's because you just caring, truly caring about them and caring about their dream as well. I uh, often ask this question in a leadership class that we have. I want you to write down the greatest leader you've ever had. It can be a parent, it can be a music teacher, it could be, you know, a peer or what have you. And there is a common theme when I ask why, why did you list that individual as the greatest leader that you've ever had? And one of the themes that comes back is oftentimes they took me to a place where I couldn't get to on my own, which was, they met me wherever I was. That's a common theme. And then this theme is that you're bringing out is they actually believed in me more than I believed in myself. Yeah. And you got to really invest as a leader. So if you're listening out there, this takes effort, man. There's like, yeah, there's a playbook and there's a handbook and there's all that stuff. But the intangibles are is investing in individuals and helping them get to a level that they can't get to on themselves by themselves. Yeah. I want to ask you about this one thing that I really, really liked. When, because when I was a player, rules drove me nuts, man, mm -hmm. and compliance and all the, you know, boundaries and all that stuff. When it wasn't explained well, your philosophy of having few rules, mm -hmm. but being really, really uh, specific on those rules. Could you just give us a little bit about your philosophy? Like, my interpretation is, I don't burden them with a hundred different rules. I have some critical rules that I make sure that they understand. So few is like, less is more. Yeah, it, you know, it was interesting as I had a, uh, uh, when I first started as a head coach at the community college level, I went to a uh, hall of fame coach and I asked him, I said, hey, what do you, what is, what are some of the rules? What things should I put in place for my program? He said, well, first thing is you don't want to have many. You need about, you know, two or three rules and just stick with those because if you did, you wouldn't, probably you got to hold them accountable to all those rules. If it's like, uh, turn off your cell phones when you, 
when you walk in through the door, then it's like, okay, you got all these rules. Now you got to hold them accountable if someone forgets to turn off the cell phone instead of establishing what our disposition is when we walk through the door. That kind of covers everything. So you, you want to generate these rules that can cover almost everything. I talk about, I got like three rules. I'm, I talk about effort, being competitive, and I talk about being on time. And so we talk about effort. That covers a lot. What's your effort like getting to the classroom? If I say competitive, how competitive are you about winning your day? So I'm talking about winning our day, winning our now. So if you need to win the day, you can't win the day if you don't go in and, and, and show up on time. You can't, you can't win the day if you're not handling your business uh, in the classroom. Uh, and you can't be competitive if, if you're not winning in the classroom. I like to kind of generalize everything under those, you know, those three rules. But I say, hey, you need to show up on time. If you're showing up and if you're being there on time, I, I think we say uh, to be on time is to be early. You know, the, the quote, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know what I'm saying? If you're on time, then you're late. And then if you're late, you absolutely are in trouble. And so we kind of stick with that. And then the principles of being early and I kind of make them feel uncomfortable by not kind of getting there early and setting that as a precedent to that that's my lifestyle. My lifestyle is being there early. But now if I'm there early, that means I'm, I'm ready. I'm preparing. And so without saying, okay, in order to come in today, you got to prepare, you got to do this, this, and this. Well, actually by making the team feel uncomfortable about not coming early. Now, if they're uncomfortable, they all get there early. If yeah. they all get there early, guess what? They're doing some level of preparation. So now I don't have to add the rule of when you walk through the door, you prepare like this, this, and this, because guess what? Now they're there early. What do I do? Okay. Now let me show you what you do. This is how you prepare fellas. Hey guys, if you show up early, you should prepare, but they walk through the door I'd give them the one rule to walk through yeah. the door early. They have nothing to do but prepare. So now we've actually accomplished several rules under being early or being on time. You know, like there's preparation. There's proper, you, you force yourself to get proper nutrition so that you have the energy to perform. Now you get your proper flexibility. You can't just walk on the court and play. Because what will happen if you show up right on time, you're not prepared, you're not lathered, you're not ready to go, you're not in a good mental health space, uh, a good mental space, mm -hmm. your body's not going, and you got to get going. So guess what? Now we have poor starts. But if we're being, if we're on time, right, the one rule of just being on time, I can cover like 10 rules. Because if yeah. you're on time, and now I really make you uncomfortable about not coming 15 minutes early at on time. Now, if you're 15 minutes early, guess what? You're getting your stretching, you're warming up, you're getting your mental space there, you've gotten your food in your system, you're stretching so you're lathered, your body is warm, you're ready to go, you got extra shots up, now you feel like you're ready, you got an urgency and energy, you got all of your gear on, you're ready to go. So now that when we hop on in that minute, everybody's like, boom, let's go. And now everybody's ready to go, yeah. we're sharp, we're crisp, and there's no poor starts. I don't have to get you started. So just by showing up on time, not only showing up on time, there's a there's a little rule under the showing up on time. Showing up on time means you're early. And just that rule, one rule alone, alone covers like 10 there's, different items. There's one other part of rules that you said in that series that ripped my face off. Like I sat with it and sat on it for about 24 hours and really thought about it. You said, Rules without relationships equals rebellion. Rebellion. Rules Dude, rebellion. that ripped my face off. Like I thought about myself as a player. I thought yeah. about myself as a coach or leader. Rules without relationships equals rebellion. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. If 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 I if I'm if I if I can't have a relationship. I mean, Joe Hampton's not going to show up on time if I don't have, if I can't really show him that I care and really show him that, look, man, this is going to be the best thing for you. These are habits that you need to build so you can be successful. He trusts me now. So he's going to show up on time because a lot of guys will put up a front. 
especially young men that have been damaged and abused and all that, they'll put up a front and what they'll do is they'll show up late to try to gain some type of attention and say, okay, here's my way of trying to get love. My way of trying to get love is by rebelling. Mm. So what I have to do is build this bond and this relationship and say, you don't have to rebel for me to get you to love or to get me to respond, okay? You don't have to rebel to get people to respond, to get negative uh, uh, you know, re reinforcement. You want positive reinforcement. Let's work on getting positive versus negative reinforcement. How do we do that? We build a relationship with them and we do those things that are gonna gain positive reinforcement. And a lot of guys, they're seeking that negative because they don't have a relationship. They don't have that trust. And that's all they know. That's all they know growing up. And, and, and so I try to build that relationship to let them know like, look, man, this is not gonna be successful in life by you getting these negative responses, by not showing up, by poor behavior, by low performance. Cause a lot of them, it, it, it's almost like barely 1% that if you don't, it, 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 that if you light a fire, that they don't perform. They usually perform. You just have to find out what it is that's going to get yeah. them to perform. For yeah. Deshaun, it was, I, I had to let him know that, hey, I, I, I'm fully invested in what you want to do in the future. He wants to be a businessman. He wants to do this and that. I had to let him know I'm right there with him and I cared. I spent hours and hours and hours with him. I could have left him alone and let him do it. But we needed hours. We had to get lawyers. We had to get so many people to help him through his mom's finances and all that stuff. And he was like, man, I can trust Moses. So guess what? When we show up the next day, I can discipline him. Mm -hmm. Now I can discipline Deshaun because I just spent hours with him with a lawyer to help him manage his life. Now the next day when I get in front of the whole team, I can say, Deshaun, you run those lines and you show up on time. And guess what? He does it goes back and forth because I invested the time. I built the relationship up with him so that he won't rebel against me now. But guess what? If I didn't help him with that, if I didn't know any of that, even though he wants a college scholarship, I say, Sean, get on that line. He may roll his eyes and say, man, I don't give a care. I don't give a flip. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because he's got so much going on in his life that I did not, that I'm not a part of. But I was a part of what's going on that he's like, man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna invest in this. I'm gonna do what Coach Mosley asked me to do. So, because he is looking out for my best interest, and I know it, he won't steer me wrong because he just invested his time in what personally I was going through, and he truly showed me that he cared. And so it always goes, it always goes back to that. It's that clearly, it's clearly a common theme in your leadership style, and I'm hoping that people are taking this away. This is more than style. It is, um, it is uh, content and philosophy and of investing in others and earning the right to, uh, to get them to invest back in you and your program. The last topic I want, to, uh, I want to bring up to you, which I thought was, it didn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. So when Rachel, uh, our VP of uh, Digital Engagement, when she was interacting with you for this interview, she came back to me and she said, oh, Coach Mosley was a recruiter. Like, and I go, well, of course he's a recruiter. He's a basketball coach. She goes, no, 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 no. He was a recruiter in business. He was a, he was a headhunter. And I thought, holy smokes, no wonder. Because for us, you know, we tell people every great leader, the best leaders I've ever seen are the ones that could recruit and bring people to their organizations. And so yeah. tell us a little bit about the advantage that you must have in doing what you do for a living with having a background in recruiting from a business perspective. Well, the thing about recruiting, man, is it's so diverse. You get so people from so many different areas. Everybody has a gift. We go back to this diamond again, right? Yeah. Everybody has a gift, but it's packaged differently. Is under this rock, under that rock. And so the biggest thing, what I like to do, so I used to be a middleman, right? So I'm a headhunter, I'm the middleman. And when I got two sides of it, you get a business, they want this great uh, individual. And then on the other side, they want this great job. So I'm right in the middle. So how can I pull this great individual? And how can I pull this individual to this, this great position? So what I have to do, number one is I'm, First, I have to pull 
what are the gifts that you have? Share with me some stories. Share with me what successes that you have. Share with me what uh, what are some some things that motivate you? What do you like to do? What do you love? What is what are you passionate about? So what can I pull from the person that I'm recruiting? What they're passionate about? What's the carrot? What do they want? And when you see that, and when you see the passion come from them, what the successes they they've had through the passion. So I used to recruit some athletes, and the athletes will come and they'll say, "Well, yeah." I'm, I just uh, got my BA degree and I did this and I did that. I said, well, you know what? Tell me about your best game. Oh, I scored 51 points. And I was like, really? What was that situation like? What was that like? Man, I was just in a zone. And who were you playing against? Oh, it was against the number one team. Really? So you mean to tell me you're able to perform against the number one team in front of tens of thousands of people under pressure, you know, or about this story. So you mean to tell me that you were able to hit the game winning free throw? I had a young lady who hit the game winning run in the World Series. She played for UCLA and she was a softball and she hit the game winning run. She came to me all quiet and was just like, yeah, I don't know what I can do. And I said, wait a minute, hold up. You performed under that pressure. That's what we're selling here. That's what we're selling. We selling you. You had a moment where you performed. You can perform. And so what, what I used to try to do is find those moments of performance. And a lot of young people don't know that they did perform. And, and we got to sell that. We, we got to pull that out of them when we're recruiting them. So I'm the middle guy. I'm pulling out, share, let's find some performances. And now I'm going to pump, I'm going to motivate you and say, see, you are a performer. You can do this. You can, you can perform. You did it. On this stage, this is what you did. And it doesn't have to be athletics. It's like, what groups were you in? How did you, where, where did you leave, lead on your college campus? What, well, yeah, I was just a part of this. What, what do you mean you were just a part of that? Why did you do that? Well, I felt led to do it. So you mean on your own, you decided to do it and you took over that organization on campus? Well, yeah, I led it, it's no big deal. No, that is a big deal. That's a big deal. That's a start, that's a leadership quality. That's a quality that a lot of people don't have. So we try to pull those successes. And then when I go to the other end, you selling those successes and say, look, this is a self-starter. This is someone that has performed and, 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 and performed on a stage with no monetary, there was no money at the end and they performed. So imagine if you attached uh, incentives, if you attach compensation, if you, if you attach uh, you know, a level of commission how they will perform. They're competitive in how they will perform. And so I was kind of in the middle of those. And so I would have to pull the stories, pull the successes, and then I would have to broadcast and I would have to share and sell and, and we would have to package those successes because a lot of, I would get a lot of students coming straight out of college or uh, even those who had already been seasoned and been in business and share specifics. I would have to share specifics that uh, maybe a company would want to hear. I'm talking Love about it. Hire, hiring managers. And yeah, that was- Love it. So that was interesting. And, I, uh, uh, yeah. I would tell you that every single one of our companies that are listening to this, everybody's recruiting. If you're not recruiting, you're dying. So every single one of our companies, let me just do a little recap on what I heard you say. Um, you're the middleman and you take the responsibility. I don't care if you're a sales leader and you're recruiting, your responsibility is to sell the company, is to qualify the candidate, but also sell the company to the candidate. And you should be, uh, if you have a recruiting department, you should own that. You should say that, you know, I'm not going to leave it up to my recruiting department. I'm going to be the person that's going to not only sell the company, but I'm also going to be the person to qualify this individual and pull out all the nuggets and to figure out what that connection is in place. So I really, really love that. And then, um, the last thing that I'm thinking about that really sums you up, Coach Mo, is I want all the leaders to listen to this. Is like the data says that men and women don't leave companies. Mm -hmm. They don't quit companies. They quit us. Mm -hmm. They quit us as leaders. Yeah. And all of these strategies that you've given us today is a real kind of acknowledgement of a responsibility of the amount of effort it takes to be a leader. 
Is there anything as we wrap up? And I want to talk a little bit about your program and uh, the real reason why I originally called you. And uh, is there anything else from a leadership perspective that we didn't talk about today that you would have thought we would have talked about? Is there anything else we didn't cover that you want to leave our listeners with? It, it, it all kind of goes back to just serving leadership, man. Which yeah. We just all what we've been talking about. Uh, I, 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 the best, the, the books and things that have been most impactful to me that I've read on leadership has been about serving. And when you serve others, man, it solves a lot of problems. And then they want to uh, believe in your dreams and your vision. And they want to help the people, the leaders that I've had that have taken a vested interest in me. I, I wanted to just push whatever they were trying to do. So whether it's my pastor who said, John, let's, let's go and let's just go eat. And I'm like, why does he want to go eat with me? And he just wants to listen to what I want to do and what my dreams are and what do I want. And he just listened to me. Those are the people I'm like, okay, those are the people that I clung to. Uh, the people that I have an impact on my life about my faith, about anything that I've done is interesting. The people that have listened to me, the people that have genuinely uh, wanted to understand what was going on with me and what wanted to know what I thought, those are the ones I clung to. The people who celebrated me, you know what I'm saying? As leaders, we got to celebrate. We got to not look to be celebrated. We have to celebrate others. The ones who celebrated me, those are ones I like. I like those people, you know, uh, because that's just human nature. And so if we celebrate in those who are, are working under us, if we celebrate in those and, and we find in a, we truly are letting them talk to us and share what's going on in their lives, they'll cling to you and they'll want to support whatever vision we have as well. And that, that's what I found to be true. So Same legit. Nature. So legit in, in our business, we talk about the most successful companies, the most successful sellers, the most successful leaders. They have this thing called an outside in approach versus an inside out approach means I'm going to come to you first to learn as much as I can about you before I even attempt to tell you about me and why I'm good for you. And so that outside in versus inside out approach is, is uh, coach, I got to tell you, it's just all over everything that you do. And we talk about consciously competent and unconsciously competent, and, and you're just doing some things that are just so amazing and so awesome. Uh, for the listeners, um, I was so compelled by Coach Mo's story. Um, I just wrote him an email and I just encouraged him. I just said, Hey dude, I have never, first of all, I was so encouraged by the way a man of faith just kind of stands up and, and, uh, has an audience of one and, and, uh, lets the chips fall where they may. And I just so respected that of living of a person living out their faith. And I just wrote him to encourage him. And then you called me right back. You sent me an email and then we got on the phone. And one of the things that I wanted to do by doing this, uh, uh, podcast we, our listeners are going to get a ton out of this. I think they're going to be so tickled that they can have a firsthand uh, listening to, you know, Coach Mosley and, and the Netflix connection, I just think it's going to be really awesome. But my gift back to you has always been, always wanted to be, I mean, you guys, you don't have a big budget. You have really like very little budget. Um, and so in the show notes, what we're going to do uh, in the podcast notes, we'll make sure that we have um, places in there where folks can donate. And, and I'm just going to do it for you, Coach, so you don't have to say anything about it. But I've been on the phone with your people. So anybody listening to this, I've talked to Dr. Roman, Roman. Uh, I've talked to the athletic director. I've talked to the people at their foundation. Um, they've set it up. It's completely legit to your donations will go right to Coach Mosley's program. Folks, his coaches don't even get paid. So I just want to kind of put that in perspective for some folks. And, you know, they're not getting all the great shoes. And I'm not saying these kids, you know, deserve or nothing. I'm not talking anything about anything that anybody deserves or is, is entitled. But if you're so moved, like I was when I watched this series, I, will, I would just hope you take the time, go into the show notes. Uh, and if you're so moved, uh, they're, your programs, they're, they're accepting donations, coach. You appreciate the donations and, and the donations go a long, long way for, for your program. It helps the kids eat. It helps you take those retreats up to that 
you know, just for gas money to get these kids from one place to the next money. And we're not talking about extravagant things, but um, uh, we just, uh, we just appreciate you so much. And hopefully you're okay with us kind of plugging that for you. Um, Yeah, that's hard for me to do, man. I I really appreciate it. And people are, they kind of get on me and say, John, you need to push it, put it on your social media. I said, it's just hard for me to ask for, you know, it, we're just investing in, in, in kids. It's just hard for me to do it. it it's just hard. It, but it really is just as simple as, you know, now the kids can get cheese on a cheeseburger, you know? Right. It, it, it's not, we're not asking for a brand new facility or anything. We just need cheese on a cheeseburger, you know, a, a extra pair of this kids that need, you know, they, they're wearing socks over and over. I mean, it's really, yeah. it could get like that where I could, instead of giving them two pair of socks, I can maybe give them 10 pair of socks for the year, you know? It's, it's, it's that, uh, instead of, you know, staying at a two star, uh, they could stay at a three star when we do one, our one travel of, I can move up, you know, the, we could stay in the hotel where the doors aren't outside. They're facing, yeah. you know, that yeah. where it's a little more intimate. So now that gives us some intimate space, just that little bit of difference changes. I can remember staying in the, the outside doors and it was like raining and we lost the, the, we stayed, the doors are inside. It was more intimate. <laughs> We were like at a Holiday Inn Express and it was like, it just felt, we got breakfast in the morning. We didn't have to pay for it. It was like, oh, it feels better. So just, just, just that it, it's, and like you said, our coaches, they, they get a small stipend and, and, uh, but still, we're going to still do the work and a little, a little goes a long way. And there's, so, there's many more people. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's say this to our listeners. If you got some value out of this and go ahead and send me an email, if this was a complete waste of your time, I'd love to hear it. Jay Kaplan at forcemanagement.com. I don't expect that I'm going to hear that though. Um, if you got some value out of this, would you just take a moment, check out the links. And if it's in your heart, if you have the capability, if you have the wherewithal, we'd ask you just to donate to the cause. I'm personally doing it. Again, I, I, uh, uh, I love what these folks are doing. It's the reason why we asked them to come on. And, and uh, so if it's in your heart, please check out that, uh, check out those links in the show notes. So coach, um, uh, just an absolute honor and a thrill for us to have this time with you. Um, uh, we love what you're doing. We love what you stand for. We'd, uh, uh, we we'd, we'd tell you, God bless you, your family, your ELAC family, um, and the men and women that uh, may they continue to bless the men and women that you lead and, and go Huskies, dude. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And yeah, anytime, man, we get together. Yeah. Love it. Go get them. Good luck this yeah. year. All right. Thank you so much. Thank Bye-bye. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.